Namaste and welcome to Youth in Development, produced by Today's Youth Asia. In the TV show Youth in Development, we bring young leaders face to face with the key players of development works. My name is Drishti and today we have with us Mr. Rick Smotkin. He is the Vice President of Government Affairs Comcast Cable Corporation. Mr. Smotkin was here in Nepal as a part of a cultural exchange program as a member of the American Council of Young Political Leaders delegation team. His responsibilities as the Vice President include developing and implementing strategies for Comcast participation in intergovernmental associations. You have traveled to 54 countries and you have also lived in Asia for two years. So how was that experience different from then living in U.S.? I lived uh, two years in East Timor, which is a small country um, in, in, right outside of Indonesia. It used to be part of Indonesia and it got its independence in 2001. I lived there from 2002 to 2004 where my primary focus was working with political parties and youth to develop the political institutions there. Um, you know, so it's kind of a similar situation to Nepal. Um, they had a civil war in East Timor in the 90s, really from about 85 to 2000, where 100,000 Timorese died during that struggle for freedom, for democracy, for independence, similar to what you guys have gone through the last you know, 10 years or so here in Nepal. So a lot of similarities, and I think it's really important that we continue to work and you know, strengthen, especially the youth movements in these countries to help make sure that we preserve the democratic movements going on. In Asia and countries like ours, Nepal, where the society is like very rigid, there's a very rigid social structure and people are rooted to their traditions. Um, do you think that this is one of the main re reasons why most of the countries in Southeast Asia, in South Asia and Nepal itself uh, has a slow developing process? So you got to find that balance between making sure you keep your traditions. Traditions for all countries, cultures, religions are very important to preserve. But at the same time, as society moves, as you know, technological changes take place, it's also important to make sure that you're adapting and adopting those kind of principles as well. So I do think that very rigid societies, if you keep them as rigid as they used to be in the past, can slow that development. Um, I think you've got to really find that balance between that. Like I said, I mean, it's critical to preserve culture and traditions. They're very important. But at the same time, you know, as you move forward, you definitely do need to find that balance where you're not being, for lack of a better word, as rigid. And, you know, democracy is definitely not rigid. Freedom is not rigid. And so I do think it's important, especially as the younger generations in these countries, that you guys are kind of the leaders in that and trying to find that balance between the past and the future. Although there are lots of ways that one can earn money in Nepal, mm -hmm. but you don't see that. Uh, they would rather go abroad. So in what ways we can use the shores of Nepal in a proper way? Especially coming from America. I mean, this is a beautiful country. I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for tourism, uh, which obviously brings money into the country. Uh, you know, you guys just got through a civil war. So I think you're going to have to continue to show to the outside world, not just America or Western world, but also rest of Asia, that you know it's safe to come here, um, that, it's, that it's stable. Um, you know, especially if you want businesses to invest from the outside, they're going to have to make sure that you know there's a continuation of power, that there's not going to be another civil war or fight in the next two years where their investment's not protected. Um, now, in the last three years, I think the country has made great strides. So far, it's been very peaceful. The last, for the most part, last three years. You obviously have a very important deadline coming up on May 28th with your constitution. I think that's going to be a critical, critical turning point for the country and how the outside world sees Nepal. Um, you know, I hopefully have, we've had this conversation with a lot of the elected, um, a lot of the leadership in this country, and most are optimistic that the constitution will be done by the 28th. And uh, you know, I think, that'll, like I said, be a very critical turning point and for you guys to show to the rest of the world that you're serious about a stable and growing democracy. During your stay here in Nepal, what is the assessment of the current political situation and of the constitution? Uh, like you said, May 20th, what next? If the constitution is not made in time, what do you think will happen or what What are the steps that one, each and every political leader should take to 
reach the deadline. Right. Meet the so, deadline. like I said, I mean, it is to me of the utmost importance that the leaders of all the parties come together and have a constitution by May 28th, and not just a constitution. I mean, it has to be a constitution that the people support and believe in. Um, right now, I am concerned that you know it's been three and a half, four years with the Constitutional Assembly, and it seems that they're not that close yet. Um, and hopefully, though, uh, like I said, it's very important, I think, both for the country to believe in it and then for the outside world to believe that you guys are, that the country is taking it very serious. Um, you know, I think if we miss the deadline, there's going to be, I'm not going to say civil war or anything like that, but I do think there'll be some negative consequences, both from what the outside world thinks of the ability of the current leadership, as well as the people. I mean, the people of Nepal, that's the most important constituency that your leadership and your political leaders have. And, you know, they've taken so long that people really, you know, they're kind of at the end of the straw type thing, and they want to see them come together and make sure that they are representing the people and the needs of the people. I think if there is no constitution by the 28th, it'll be seen as a, as a real setback to the people, and it'll be hurtful to democracy. People might start, you know, not believing it in, in it as much as they want to and seeing kind of the, the negative sides of democracy if the people can't come together. As being a vice president of government affairs of Comcast Cable Operation, uh, what help and support do you seek from government uh, being a uh, cable operation? Right. So in America, um, lobbying is almost kind of a, a unique uh, profession in America. Um, you know, most of my work, I work closely with elected officials to advance the goals of the business goals of Comcast. So, you know, there's a numerous issues that our company faces, um, whether it's, you know, employee uh, issues, whether it's tax issues. Taxes are a very big issue for us. Um, you know, there's a lot of technology issues that we're dealing with in America. Um, and so what my goal is as a lobbyist is to always be advancing our business needs in front of elected officials at all levels, the local, the state, and the federal. You have had, like, previously worked in implementing strategies for uh, women empowerment in East Timor. So how do you define women empowerment and what do you think is the role of men in assisting uh, women empowerment? So women empowerment to me is a critical aspect of any strong democracy and strong country. Um, when I was in East Timor, one of the programs we specifically had was called the Women's Caucus. And the main role is we hired uh, several local Timorese women to help promote the importance of women participating in the political process. Now that didn't necessarily mean they have to run for office. That's a critical component, but it's also just being active, whether it's you know being in the media or being part of a political party, not necessarily an MP. But uh, you know, women participation is is very critical. Um, you know, I know here even in team, in uh, in Nepal, um, you have active participation among, by women in the in the parliament and the constitutional assembly both from the party perspective proportional as well as direct i think 38 women were elected directly which i think is a very good sign in america we have you know very strong participation by women there's no barriers but if you look at our congress um you know there's not a it's not 50 50 by any means that represent us in the in the Congress, you know, it's probably 20% at most. Um, but I think the critical part is no barriers, and that women need to be supported, need to be pushed um, to run. And I know, especially in Nepal and other cultures, you know, women have are seen sometimes as you know supposed to be playing a different role. And I think that's hurtful in the long run for um, the strengthening of a democracy. Continuing to stay here in Nepal, what has been the most memorable moment for you? And what will you miss uh, after you go back to your country? What I will miss most is the hospitality. Um, the people of Nepal have been extremely warm and open and free about talking to us. So I'm going to really miss that. It's been a, you know, in America, we don't learn a lot about Nepal. It's not a country of strategic importance. But being here has been, you know, really an amazing experience for me to meet with people and hear about the struggles you've had, but how far you've come and kind of the hope for this for this nation. So that's been just the most rewarding part and the part I'll miss most. Um, 
today was an amazing day. This morning we flew, took the plane to Mount Everest, to the mountain, which was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Um, the other most uh, memorable in a different way was going to the Indian and the uh, uh, Nepal border. Uh, you know, very interesting to see kind of the lack of structure, uh, kind of chaotic, um, but trying to do good things. I mean, we met, we saw um, the anti-trafficking booth there. I mean, so there's, people are trying to really make a difference. We met with the police chief out there who's really trying to crack down on the drug trafficking across there. So I think I saw a lot of good steps forward um, out there. What sort of advice would you give to youths, aspiring youths, who want to be like you or be in your position? I never say it like that. I mean, to me, what's most important is that you guys, you know, really are the future of this country. Um, you know, you guys really are the ones who are going to make the difference and be the difference maker of where this country ends up 10 or 20 years ago. That's why it's just been so inspiring to me meeting a lot of your peers and um, the staff that uh, today use Asia. <laughs> and, you know, but the fact that, you know, people who had the ability to live in America decided to come back here to do the right thing for their country. I mean, that's an inspiring message and one that you don't often see. I mean, most people are more self-serving. If they could have a better life and have the financial resources or opportunities to live in America or in Europe, you know, that's what most people will do. But the fact that a lot of these people, a lot of you guys have come back after having those opportunities to make this country a better place is really the best thing that any of you guys can do. And you guys really are the, you know, the hope for a, a brighter future here in Nepal. Thank you very much, Mr. Rick Smotkin, for being with us today and sharing your insightful thoughts and ideas. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to your feedback. Our email address is utya at the rate gmail.com. We'll be back next week. At the same time, have a nice week. Namaste. Mm -hmm.